to uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Uh, there are several scriptures I could have used uh, in this, uh, but this is probably one of the best ones, and I'm going to use some here that God's dealt with me over over the last uh, two or three weeks uh, since we've been involved in this, and I've been working at it. And uh, there's some things that God has even showed me, uh, little tidbits here and there, uh, that I wasn't even looking for before. To be honest with you, I, I wasn't looking for them at all. Uh, but God did show me some extra stuff in here that um, once I went searching, he pointed out some things since we were dealing uh, with that. And uh, we're going to be here in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, and we're going to deal with the idea or deal with the, the um, theology here of Calvinism. Uh, I never dreamed that I'd see the day that we may have to go this route. Uh, but it is at hand, and I find out through much research now that it is spreading across America like wildfire. Uh, they say that I think it's uh, England now, uh, in most of their Baptist churches, that they are about 90% Calvinistic uh, in their beliefs, even in England now, and it's spreading. And one thing we have to understand about Satan, okay, is that he cannot, he cannot bind up the truth, okay? He can't do that. Uh, he can't wipe away the truth. Uh, he cannot bind up the truth. But he can do a very good job at distorting the truth. And he can make it sound so real. Remember that he has turned his ministers into angels of light. Amen? And why is that? So that they'll look like God. And so that they'll look like they're real. And so that they can teach things. Or that are not doctrinally sound. Uh, and uh, this is not the first time this has happened throughout our country. It's happening all over the place. There's other pastors that's uh, dealing with it. And uh, I in no way, shape, form, or fashion want to have to go here because I don't want to confuse anybody. Uh, that's why I'm going to go very slow. And if you have any confusing questions, uh, you make sure you write them down and bring them to me because I'm going to try my best to answer them for you. And uh, Brother Kidman asked me last night if I needed any help on it. I told him to be praying about it because he uh, probably studied this maybe as deep as I have or deeper. Uh, and so I have him, uh, you know, on my side here too to help out uh, if we do need it. Uh, but more than anything, we're going to trust God. We're going to trust the Word of God uh, in what we do because I don't want people confused. This stuff, let me tell you what this stuff does. It, it confuses people to the point that uh, I, I thought about this yesterday. It will confuse people to the point from a pastor's standpoint of view. And trust me, I'm not here to beat anybody up. I'm not here to say that we're better than anybody. I'm not here to say that I, I have all the knowledge and, uh, and wisdom. But I do know, and every time I read this and every time I look at this, that this stuff causes so much confusion when it gets inside the church that people literally wonder if they can believe a man of God uh, or a pastor that's taught them all their life, that's uh, loved on them, that's prayed for them, that's done everything for them, uh, and because they get confused, they walk away. They don't go with the Calvinistic belief, but they walk away from here because they don't know if they can trust what I'm saying, okay, or any pastor when it comes that way. So that's how the devil distorts and confuses, and I'm saying, okay, if you don't believe them, and that view, why are you leaving here? Well, because I'm confused. <laughs> so what are you confused about? If you go to the church down the road and they believe the same way we do, are you still going to be confused? Well, I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just confused. And so we know one thing, that the God's not the author of confusion. Amen. Amen. But the devil is. You've heard me say when God does something, he puts a period after it. When the devil does something or says something, he always puts a question mark after it. Amen. And so we have to know the difference here. Uh, in what we're looking at. And Calvinism is nothing more than a Protestant Reformation of theology, and uh, it's basically taught and reformed by John Calvin. Now, now John Calvin didn't start Calvinism, I will uh, tell you that. It was started way before that, but he was the, he is now, or has been for many, many, many years now, the, one of the main teachers of that and trying to confuse people. And they, of course, they know that they were. Uh, ones that broke away from the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century and uh, having the beliefs of predestination and election 
uh, of salvation. Now, before we even get started, can I tell you all tonight, I believe in predestination. But I believe God predestinate all of us. <laughs> I believe in a sovereign election. But I believe that God sovereignly elected all of us. Amen. That all of us have a choice in that, whether we want to accept Christ or not. Now, if we did not believe that way, I'm going to give you many scriptures that you're going to have to erase out of your Bible. Amen? Because God did not put any contradictions in that, but I would have to give you many scriptures. You would have to erase out of your Bible if it were not for all, if salvation were not for all. Amen? Now, I do clearly understand that not all is going to accept him. I, I'm not dumb enough to believe, and the Bible does not say that all are going to accept him, but I do believe that he gave all a chance to accept him. Now, it's a difference in believing in the, so the, the and here's the thing, is that you can believe so strongly in the sovereignty of God, but you can't believe in the grace of God. Amen? And so it takes a, a, a sovereign belief in God because he is a sovereign God. I mean, God is in control of everything there is. You know, God makes any decisions he wants to make. I understand that because he is God. But we also have to understand that there's the grace side of that, that God is just as graceful as he is sovereign. Amen? And so I even read today in Calvinism, there are some of them that believe that there, there are literally, this is true, you can go look, you can go study it and read it and, and look it up and Google it. Uh, Brother Kidman, they literally believe, and you probably know this, that there are two separate doctrines in the Word of God. But that we are to believe both of them <laughs> just because God wrote them. Amen? And uh, so if there's two doctrines, you know, that means there is a difference there somewhere. And that word difference or division bothers me. Amen? Because uh, it's hard for me to believe that God wrote something, something to mean something over here and wrote something totally against it to believe over here that God would confuse us that way because he's not the author of confusion. But they literally believe that there are two separate doctrines in the Word of God and that it's up to us to believe both of them because of a sovereign God. Well, one of them does not supply the grace of God. <laughs> one of them does supply the grace of God. But the other one does not supply the grace of God. And so I choose, <laughs> I choose to believe that one that supplies the grace of God. Uh, there again, I don't have to go and start erasing scriptures out of my uh, Bible or blacking them out uh, in the Word of God. And so we're going to look at some of those things tonight and look at the idea, uh, did God choose some people to be saved and others that he just born them in this world to go to, to die and go to hell uh, without ever a chance, without even an inkling of a chance to go to heaven. Would our, God, would our God do that? They say, he'll do that because he's sovereign. Well, would he not do that because he's full of grace? Amen? And so we have to look at both sides of that. And, and that's, that's what people are having a problem with. Not, not only here, uh, but the more you study, you'll find that it's everywhere. But uh, Paul told Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, it's a very familiar uh, scripture here, it is the apostasy of the last days uh, that is predicted here. Uh, and uh, we find a resource here in the scriptures for you and I to go to. But he said this, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And this we're not talking about some of these things, but some of it we are going to get into that you'll see. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, uh, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, here we go. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. We've got to be careful with these kind of things. Amen. They have a form of godliness, but they have to deny the power of God if they deny the grace of God. Amen. There ain't a one of us in here that can, can explain grace. Amen. All I know is it's God's riches at Christ's expense. All I know is that he did something to me that I don't deserve. I, and no other man deserves. There ain't a one of us in here that deserves to go to heaven. Amen. Uh, there ain't nobody born that deserves uh, to go to heaven. And the very fact that, and thought that God would, would born some and think they deserve to go and these don't deserve to go really bothers me. Amen. And uh, to, to even have a belief in a God uh, that way. But that's what's happening here. They're ever learning uh, and never able to come. Uh, to the knowledge of the truth. 
And it said, verse 6, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away uh, with divers' lusts. And trust me, there, there's much deceit in Calvinism, okay? Much deceit uh, in Calvinism. Ever learning, never able to come uh, to the knowledge of truth. And we're going to talk about truth before all this is over uh, also. Now as James and Jammers with, uh, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning faith. If you believe the way that they do, faith is completely taken out of the picture. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is a substance, amen? Faith is something, we have, we have something in, in our faith. But if you believe in Calvinism, faith is completely taken out. We would never need faith. There would be, there'd be no reason for faith whatsoever. And so we find here in the Word of God, when you look at this, it said, it said, uh, it says, uh, they, they're, they're reprobate concerning faith. But they shall proceed, proceed no further, for their folly shall be, shall be manifest unto all men, as their lives also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering. Why would we have such a long-suffering God if people are going to be elected anyway? If they're already going to be saved regardless, why would God be so long-suffering? Amen. Why would he? Why would he have to go through any pain at all? Matter of fact, why would he allow his son to come and be beaten and killed and hung on a cross for something he already knew was going to happen? Amen. When you look at these things, it's almost crazy to think about what's written in the Word of God. But he said, "Listen, the faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecution, affliction." which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecution I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will, what does that word say, all? You need, you need to pay close attention to that word. You're probably going to hear it a lot. Because it, Brother Don Harrell used to say uh, it means all in the Greek. It means all in the Hebrew. It means all in the redneck. Amen. It means everywhere I've ever seen it, it still means all. Amen. It, it, it don't change its definition, amen. It is still all anywhere it is written at in the Word of God, in Webster's Dictionary, it still means all. And so when you look at that, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse, worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But listen to what God says. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned as be, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Through what? Salvation through faith. Calvinism says that we do not have to have faith because it's not up to us to believe. That we don't have a choice whether we believe or not. Amen? So what good is faith? We would not have to have any faith whatsoever. So, so, listen, if you were to believe that way, you can go ahead and write, just, jot, just blot this scripture out of the Word of God. Amen? But it's a salvation through faith. Amen? We have to remember that. And it's which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. They talk about, uh, in Calvinism, they uh, teach that unless, so listen to this. I just read this the other day. It gets, just gets deeper and deeper the more I read. And it's been years since I, I went there and studied it. Um, and in their belief, uh, there's some that literally believe that you're not supposed to witness to a person unless they already show fruits of righteousness. Yes. Look it up. Read it. You don't have to take my word for it. Go Google it. Instead. Go, go, go read about it and find it. That the people that they are supposed to witness to are the people that already show fruits of righteousness. 
If my mind serves me right, there's never been a tree that's produced fruit unless it was planted. Unless it was rooted and grounded, it never will produce fruit. Amen? And we're never going to be rooted and grounded until we trust Christ with our life. Amen? And so in their belief and their doctrine, they are taught that if you see some living right, doing right, or doing good works, you know, you may say, and, and, and look like they're going the right path, they're the ones you go after because it's possible, it's a good chance that they are the elect. But ask one of them who the elect are. And they'll tell you, we don't know. They have to tell you we don't know because, what, because, the, because the Bible don't tell us who they are. So they'll look at you and say, well, we don't know. I said, so how can you determine that it's that man that's walking the right path versus that, that, that drunk on the street that needs Christ? How can you determine that? And they have no little answer for that. Amen? The Bible is clear that they that are not sick need not a physician. Amen? So Jesus goes out to those that are sick, sin sick, amen, those that need uh, Christ. But they literally teach that in their doctrine that when you go after that, they, if, they don't, if they don't show some witness of righteousness, then there again it's hard for them to, uh, to believe that they have any uh, thing at all for them to go after. You know that, okay, they're not one of the elect. And like I say, I, I talked to one recently and, uh, and supposedly he was saved a while back and I asked him about his salvation and he said yes. And, and uh, I said, so are you going to heaven because you're saved or because you're elected? He said, well, I'm going because I'm one of the elect. I said, so you didn't need to be saved? He said, yes, I did. I said, so then who are the elect? He said, we don't know then how can you tell me that you're one of the elected and you think you're going because you're, I said, did you have to be saved in order to go? Well, yeah. And I'm just getting more confused. About, now, I'm not confused with what the Word of God says, but I'm getting confused about what's coming out of his mouth. You know, when he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth, I had to be saved, but I'm not going to heaven because I was saved. I'm going because I was elected, but I don't know if I'm one elected, but I, I still think I'm going. It's very confusing. Don't, I, I, Jane and I were talking this afternoon. She said, Daddy, you're going to confuse a lot of people. I'm not here to confuse you. I will stop, slow down, answer any question I need to answer. Amen. And we're going to answer it from the Word of God. Because I do not want you confused with what's going on. Listen, it ain't, and it ain't just in Person County and, and in our church. It's, it's, listen, it's coming like a tiger. According to the reports that I'm seeing and the reports Brother Kidman's saying it too, the reports I'm seeing now when, as I dive into this uh, more and more, Brother Mike, it, it's spreading like wildfire, you know, all over. And, and you know what they're looking for? They're looking for another reformation in that. Uh, and they want to drum that up, uh, and they want to pull away from the local church, you know. And, uh, and now, of course, they're to the point that they don't even want uh, to be involved in organized church anymore, and that's very, so unbiblical, it's, un, it's unreal when you truly... Uh, look at it. It's built around the idea that man does not have a choice. Uh, if I remember correctly, in Joshua chapter number 24, and, uh, uh, fifth, ch uh, chapter number 15, and verse number 24, Joshua said, said choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Amen. How many of y'all believe that Hebrews 13, 8 is still true in the Bible, that he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever? He's the same God of the, of the New Testament as he was in the Old Testament. He, the Bible said that God changes not. He's the God that cannot lie. He's the same God back then as he is now. And so if you had to choose God back then, you've got to choose God now. Amen. Amen. And I understand God's sovereignty. That God can do anything he wants to do. I understand all of that. But we have to understand there was a lot of grace there when he sent his only begotten son to die for us on the cross of Calvary. That we might have life and have life eternal and uh, believing in a sovereign election i don't have a, a problem with that but when it comes to distorting the gospel uh and as, and i already said they can't change the truth and the devil cannot change the truth but he can distort the truth and that's the problem that we have when it gets very confusing
and sometimes we have to come and and try to try to get on a level playing field and try to get all the information that we can out try to do it in a way that people will sit uh, and understand we're not going to try to talk over your head uh, we want to try to answer the questions along the way uh, just to make sure Galatians chapter 5 verse 9 says this a little leaven leaven is a whole lump it don't take but just a little bit of it to get it started a little bit here and a little bit there you know uh, it becomes a very slippery slope after that you know you, you let this in you let that in you start doing this uh, you start doing it first Timothy chapter chapter number one verse 19 says holding faith and a good conscience which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck can I tell you what it'll do it will shipwreck a church it will shipwreck a congregation it will mess a church up uh, if you allow it to get in there, you allow it to uh, fester in there, you allow it to build uh, in there. And listen, just mark this down. Satan always wants authority. If he can have a place, a position, he'll stay there for a while. Amen? Long enough to mess everybody up anyway. He wants a place to teach. He wants a place to preach. He wants a place of authority uh, over some folks so they can be an authority. Uh, and say some things and do some things, even if he don't just mess up the, the, the whole truth of it, he gets enough truth, enough lie in there to distort the truth. Just that little bit here and there. In uh, Genesis chapter 1 and, and verse number 3, anybody knows what that says? Say what, what the serpent told Eve, hath God said, amen. Matter of fact, let me let me go go back to that real quick. I I I I, I saw something here today uh, that I just don't remember seeing before. wasn't looking at it as hard as I am right now. Uh, but Genesis chapter number three, verse number Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, God did say, look with me to Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. This is how they distort it. You listen, listen to what he said. Yea, hath God not said that, you know, you could eat, could eat of every tree of the garden? God did say they could eat of every tree of the garden. Amen? He said it right here in Genesis chapter number 2, but we're going to finish that. Look at verse number 15. Genesis 2 and 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it up. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Look at verse 17. But, <laughs> so that it, no doubt Satan told her exactly what God had said. Did he not? Had, did, had God said that you couldn't eat, didn't he say you could eat, eat of every tree of the garden? God did. But Satan's got to tell her that part. Amen. So he told her some truth. He just didn't tell her all truth amen and that's what happens a lot of time they will tell you some truth they just not going to give you all truth i want all truth that word all means a lot to me i want all truth in the matter not just some truth amen i've been in situations before i've been talking to people about this that, and other and just trying to get the uh, truth out of them and and they'll tell you certain parts and certain parts of this. And I'm like, is that all of it? Or do you not want me to know the rest? I ask you for the whole story. And so Satan is real good at, listen to this. He is real good at delivering truth, just not delivering all truth. He leaves out those little things here and there that would mean everything. He quoted the exact thing God had said to them, exactly what God told Adam, and he quoted to Eve. 
And she's probably, and listen, look up here. The one problem that Eve had, I need you to understand this, if you don't get on this tonight, is she spent a little too long listening to him. She lingered way too long. If we're very smart and we'll learn our Bible and we'll get, we'll get in the Word of God and we'll study and we'll pin this stuff down in our hearts and minds, once we hear it, we'll turn a deaf ear to it. We won't linger around it. If you start lingering around it, trust me, you're going to hear what, what they, yeah, that was truthful. Yeah, I, I remember God said that. I, I remember that was in, in my Bible somewhere. But <laughs> they never did get that part. Satan never did get that part with Eve. Amen. He stopped right there. But we can all agree that he told her the truth, right? But he didn't give her all the truth. He stopped short of what God said and what God meant when he came. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. And God was clear here. For in the day that thou eatest thou of, thou shalt surely die. That's not the truth he wanted her to hear. Now let me ask you this. Did he know she was going to die? Yes. <laughs> he knew that she would die spiritually the moment she disobeyed God. He knew that and made her believe otherwise. Just by not giving her full truth. Be careful what you hear. Make sure you hear the whole story I heard some stories recently and it was concerning this church and I was willing to hear them out I'm kind of like Jonathan McNeese Michael O. Dutail <laughs> amen <laughs> I'm not looking for gossip but if I can clarify some things and fix some things from this pulpit with my people I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to get in a Facebook war with anybody, Amen. Uh, but if I can clarify some things that's non-truth and is not full truth, I will clarify it at the right place and right time, and I will clarify it openly. I'm not going to run in secret and clarify it. I'm going to clarify it openly so that everybody knows it. But those that they want to tell a part of the truth or a piece of the truth, we got to be careful. And there are those that they would go out in the store and they and somebody would come and say, well, you know, we're so-and-so. I said, really? Can I tell you the real truth? You know, I don't have to tell you anything, but just so you understand about New Life Baptist Church, let me tell you the real truth. Now, if you don't believe that's the real truth, come to our church. Amen? You've never been in our church. So why don't you come to our church? At least if you gave them the benefit of the doubt of believing half-truth, how come you can't give us the other half of that benefit? Unless you just want gossip. <laughs> you want something you can gossip about. Why don't you come and give us the benefit? Because you've already given them the benefit of that because you're asking me about it. Why don't you come give us the benefit of that and hear our side of it? There's two sides to every story. I told, uh, I don't know if I told you all this, I told Brother Tim Shook, Brother Steve Shook's brother, when he called me last week, and uh, he's coming to preach for us on the 18th of September. And uh, I, I don't know him. I just know Brother Steve. And uh, if he's Brother Steve's brother and Brother Steve recommended him, I know he's a good man. He called me and I said, um, he, I said, yeah, I said, Brother Steve told me about you. And he said, he told me several things. Number one, you were the ugly brother. <laughs> Number one, you were the sorest brother. Number three, that he was the best preacher out of both of y'all and that he was the best looking. Amen. He said, Preacher, just so you know, there's two sides to every story. <laughs> he said, I'll tell mine when I come to your church. <laughs> so Brother Steve is in trouble when his brother gets here because he's going to be here that day. But listen, there is two sides to every story, and I fully understand that. But make sure you hear both sides. Make sure you hear it out, and make sure you compare it with full truth from the Word of God. Just not a piece of the truth. Because if you only hear a piece of the truth, it can be very well distorted because the rest of it's not there. 
I found that out today in the Word of God. Just by, just by looking at this, that he literally told her the exact words that God had said and told her full truth in what he told her. He just didn't tell her all of it. So I want to advise you, and I want to help you. If you're confronted with that, find full truth. Find both sides of the story. Find the Word of God. Go look it up in the Word of God. Ask the questions that you need to ask to make sure that it is full truth and it's not taken, as I, as I said, uh, it's not taken to the point where you take a, a, a bottle cap size of, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, doctrine uh, and the Bible. You take a bottle cap size and you place everything right here in this little bottle cap size of the doctrine and you, you throw all the rest of the doctrine away and says, I'm just going to believe it by this right here. Amen? The Bible says we're to preach the whole counsel of God. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke uh, with all long suffering. But if we're not careful, we'll take that little bit of truth right here, amen, in this little bottle cap size, and we will forget everything else. And this is all we can dwell on is this little part right here. And we got a whole Bible. We got 66 books of the Bible to research it Old Testament, New Testament. Doctrine, topical, whatever you want to call it in the Word of God, we have to understand that truth goes a lot deeper than just a few words every now and then. Amen? I told Brother Mike, there's another little quirk right here. Brother Mike said something last night. Him and Brother Gene were talking when I walked into the men's meeting last night. And... Um, I forgot even what they were saying, but whatever they were saying, I told Brother Mike, I said, listen, don't ever let Miss Joan tell you that you are a model husband. <laughs> I don't want Jane to tell me that. Amen? It sounds good, don't it? Look, he said, he's a model husband. You know, that would sound great. But you know what a model is? It's just a small imitation of the real thing. <laughs> Some of y'all will get that in a minute. <laughs> Amen. It, it's all, <laughs> listen, <laughs> it's all in word design, Miss Kathy. Amen. We got to design the right words to say the right thing and have the right truth. Now, I know that's a little off base this, but listen, we can be told a lot of things, but we need to be told the whole story. And so make sure we get real truth. Now, now turn with me uh, back over to dealing with this same, same thing that mixing a little bit of truth with lies does not make it true. What does it make it? It's still a lie. It's still a lie, right? Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We back, now, we've been back in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. And we see what Satan did there. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Look at verse 3 and 4. Let me, matter of fact, let me read verses 1 through 4. Paul says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Now, we just read in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that our mind can be corrupted from the simplicity of faith in Christ Jesus. Amen? And now we see here that our minds can be corrupted from the simplicity. God didn't make it hard. God did not try to confuse us and make us messed up in this world uh, to the point that we didn't know how to believe uh, the Word of God. And if you're not careful, that stuff gets so confusing, you don't know what to believe. Amen? And so there is simplicity in Christ. God is sovereign. We understand that. Jesus Christ is sovereign 
We understand that. The Bible is a sovereign Bible. We understand that. Amen? But God made it so simple that even a little child could understand when it comes to salvation. And we need to, need to be careful lest our minds be drawn away from that and we get to the point and go, oh, I'm so confused I don't know what to believe. And can I tell you, all this is doing is just confusing the church. Somebody told me the other day, <laughs> Uh, we, that meant something about it. And they said, boy, I'm just all confused. I'm messed up. I, I don't even know what to believe anymore. Why? The devil just confused them. Got them, got them messed up. You know? And like I said, the, the, he can, the, the devil can take the same people, me as a pastor, that I pour my life into. Uh, I, I, I witness them. I, I, uh, I go after them for Christ, win them to the Lord. I, 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 I disciple them. I spend time. And them, I love on them, I pray for them. And all of a sudden, in one instant of confusion, the very person, whether it's me or you or anybody else, the very person that has poured into them all of their life is confused about who you are because of this doctrine. How can we get that confused that quick? Well, may I ask this? Think about this. How did they become that smart that quick? How did they get smarter in three months? And listen, you've heard me say many, many times, I'm not the smartest cookie in the jar. But I'm not going to be bought over either. So how did they get so smart in a few months to take over the minds that somebody's been preaching and teaching to for 17 years and pouring into them and loving them and discipling them and visiting them and, uh, I mean, just pouring your life into them and all of a sudden, they're confused about who you are. And they're not even confused about who they are. You can't tell me that's not Satan. He pulls away from the simplicity of the mind. And what God has tried to pour into people for years and years and years. And we need to be careful. Wherever we're confronted on this, it don't matter where we're confronted. Listen, you can be confronted at work. You can be uh, confronted at church. You, but wherever we're confronted, we need to understand that we need to have the mind of Christ. Amen. And our mind needs to be focused on the Word of God, the simplicity of the Word of God. The faith, our faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, if you believe in election, you won't need any faith. Although they say, you still got to believe in Christ to get saved. I'm like, okay, so who makes that choice? Well, you don't get to make it. So Christ determines whether I believe or not. I don't get it. I, I just don't get it, Brother Kidney. I can't buy into it. I can't, I can't make my mind go there. I can't fathom the very thought that Christ said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die on the rugged cross. I'm going to shed my blood for you, you know, and I'm going to give you the gift of salvation. I, Josh, if you walked up here and give me a, gave me a gift tonight, would it not be up to me to receive it? If I didn't want it, he can't force it on me. It would be up to me to receive it, Right? It is a gift. It is a gift of salvation. And unless I receive that, I don't have it. But that's my choice. That's my choice. I don't believe God made us robots. Another reason, too, I'll throw marriage in there. Marriage is a model of our walk with Christ. How many of y'all would want to be married to somebody you had to make marry you? And you had to make her love you every day? Amen? <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have one of them, Brother Ken. Amen? But, I mean, think about it. If you got up every day and you had to make her love you or make him love you every day. Amen? I married them all walk, I, I walk with uh, Christ. Amen? And uh, can I say this? In marriage? Go ahead and mark this down. It's not give and take. It's give. Why? 
he gave. He didn't take anything. But if he made us all robots and elected some and didn't elect others, then he made them his own. And they didn't have a choice in that. So what about the rest of them? Well, they don't get a choice. I can't buy into that. I will never, by the grace of God, be able to buy into that. What are you saying, preacher? A little leaven leavened the whole lump. Amen? That tree is not going to have any fruit unless it's planted. He said it again right here. In Christ. Faith in Christ. Simplicity in Christ. It has to be planted in Christ. We're not going to show any fruits of righteousness. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of good people out here. So do we say that all the good people are the elect? And all the bad people are not? Is that the way it works? The Bible don't say that. Amen. He came to seek and save that which was lost. So, he didn't say, I'm going to seek and save half of the lost, part of the lost, some of the lost. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So, and you have to be saved and not be in a lost condition in order to be the elect. So if he came to seek and to save that which was lost, he elected all of them. It's up to us as whether we make that choice or not to receive what Christ has already done for us, the finished work on the cross of Calvary. It's not by works. It's by his righteousness. It's by, by the finished work on the cross of Calvary. It's that we don't have any works to boast of. None of us deserve hell, uh, heaven. Amen? None, none of us are, are good enough to to go to heaven, but because of the grace of God, he made a way that we could. But Satan's attack is to distort the truth. And if he can confuse the truth, he only has to give you a little bit of truth. He don't have to give you a lot. You know, um, it's kind of that, that thing of uh, you, you young ladies listen to me tonight. Okay, you're dating that young guy. I was young one time, believe it or not. Jane and I dated before we got mad, believe it or not. <laughs> Amen. It's that thing of trust me. Why? Why should I trust you? Well, I'm Mike Witt, so? You know, I've done this, I've done to prove it. Amen. I'm this guy or I'm that guy. Okay, good. Prove it. And when you prove it, you might have my trust. And until, and until then, you don't have my trust. Amen? And so with these people or anybody that comes after you with Calvinism, listen, they better, they better bring a whole boatload of something and make me not have to erase anything at all in my Bible. Because if I have to erase anything at all in my Bible... They're done with. They're done with. Okay? So we have to be careful. It's 801. I know i got to quit. He's the same God yesterday and today and forever. Next week, I promise you, we're going to pour back into this. Amen? I'm going to pour everything I can into this just so that you're stronger, I'm stronger, this church is stronger, that we can be overcomers. And by the way, what a great Wednesday night class. My goodness. You know, I, I said around here Sunday morning, that, you know, when God, Brother Cruz and I were talking about this tonight, he came to me tonight. He said he'd been thinking about that word consumed all week long, how God consumed us all week long. You know, and uh, we come this Sunday morning, boy, if God consumes us. And I, I told Brother uh, Cruz this tonight. I said, think about it this way. The word of God, God himself, if we did think about it in, in the terms of young ladies, young boys, marriage, you know, that, that girl that we meet, we think we're going to marry, we're going to marry. How many of y'all miss her every day? Amen. Amen. I said, take her home tonight, I want to go back and pick her up tomorrow. Amen. I take her home that night, I want to go back and pick her up tomorrow. Amen. That's the way it is with God and God's Word. And if we love it, we indulge in it, we eat it up, we learn it, we believe in it, we can get out of this stuff 
and not be harmed. Amen. The devil's done enough damage. Would you all agree? He's done enough damage. And I want to do my very best to try to inform you, educate you, help you, instruct you, teach you so that you know what real truth is. I'm going to give you all the truth I can find. All the truth. I, I'm, I'm not gonna, just going to give you part of it and stop. I'm going to give you all the truth I can find. Next week, we may get into the five major points of Calvinism. You know, I don't know that we'll get through all of them because there's a lot to, to, to detect and, and, and talk about with each one of them on where we would stand as Christians, Bible-believing Christians, amen, that does away with their theology and what the Word of God says. Go ahead, Miss Ms. 